All right, so Tanberg Telecom, also known as just Tanberg, the video conferencing company, was a very successful organization. Started from scratch around 1990, and then during the next two decades, uh, it was effectively competing and systematically outperforming all other market players in the video conferencing industry. By 2010, Tanberg was a billion dollar business with a 50% market share, 1,700 employees worldwide. In uh, April 2010, Tanberg was acquired by the American tech behemoth, Cisco Systems, for 19 billion Norwegian kroners. That's approximate, that was approximately 3.3 billion US dollars. The dollar is changing these days. Or actually, maybe it's a chrome that is changing. Anyway, so Tanberg, 1990 to 2010, rest in peace, uh, was a legendary success that deserves to be lifted up, praised and studied. Um, Tanberg was characterized by a unique organizational culture, a fantastic sales team, uh, very competent and charismatic leadership, but first of all, it had an engineering team that was able to churn out spectacular and successful products for two decades. My name is Olve Mödal, and I'm here to give some insight into the Tanberg way of engineering. First of all, the story that I'm going to tell has nothing to do with Tanberg Display, Tanberg Space Travels, Tanberg Data, Tanberg Car Wash and Pizza. Uh, hmm? um, Tanberg is a common surname in Norway. Uh, there are a lot of companies called Tanberg. Uh, I think there are over 100 companies called Tanberg. Um, there is a tiny connection though to Tonberg Radiofabrik, uh, famous worldwide for premier audio equipment like uh, radios, receivers, amplifiers, and uh, speakers, tape recorders. But in 1978, uh, Tonberg Radiofabrik went bankrupt. So a few business people, they acquired the f name, the spelling, the font, um, like this, a trademark, they acquired it and kept it in a drawer for about 10 years. Until the business genius, Jan Christian Uppsal, I really mean it, business genius, and the video phone project from Televerke Forskningsinstitut joined forces approximately 1990 to form what is now known as Tanberg. And that is the story that, this is where the story starts. The first proper product was the Tanberg Vision. Wikipedia, dictionaries, uh, encyclopedias, they say it was out in 91. But that's really not true because uh, it's, it wasn't until 1993 that they were finished debugging the hardware and the software so it could actually be used for anything. Um, it used to burn up, actually, because it got so warm. Um, but eventually it worked, and uh, it was kind of a successful product. Uh, as the cornerstone to a large series of products, the Vision series, uh, that you see here. Um, the Vision Series was replaced by the classic and MXP lines of products. And then in around 2008, there was a new series of products coming out. Actually, the first line of products uh, where we used C++, so that's worth mentioning. Um, and this was in 2010, from 2008 up till t and the state of the art and by 2010. I don't have all the numbers, but I have a few uh, of the revenue of the Tanberg organization over the years. Um, they should be more or less exact. But there is another number that I find 
even more interesting, and, and that is how much is invested into R&D? How many engineers do you have? Uh, because that also tells you something about how much do the organization believe in itself? If you don't really believe in yourself, you will not invest much in R&D and engineers. Uh, but if you do, then you just you just uh, invest a lot into R&D uh, to create new products and make more money and grow. And this is an interesting curve. Um, and at that time, we had uh, offices around the world. It was still focused in, in Oslo, at least soccer, uh, most people. But we had offices in UK, in uh, India, of course in the US, and also uh, in New Zealand. We participated. Tanberg was a great place to work. Uh, for three years, uh, and we were on the top of that list. Actually, second place in 2008. Uh, we lost to Flytoge. Um, the rumor says that they just got new un uniforms the day before the survey. So that might explain the 2008 defeat. But it, w it was a great place to work. April 19, 2010. That was the acquisition was completed. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and this is where the, my story ends. In this talk. I continued into Cisco for nine years. But this talk is about Tanberg, not Cisco. So let's take a look at the product. Kind of a typical example of what we did at Lysarker. The Tanberg Codex C90. Actually, I don't think it's end of life. Well, it's probably end of life, but it's still out there. So it's uh, worth studying, for sure. It's a really, really mean machine. Um, it's a codec that could... Uh, <laughs> encode and decode uh, audio and video signals, basically. Um, one of the features was that you could connect a lot of devices to it. And the way it operated was that you could con connect four HD input streams into the device at the same time. And we're talking 1080p. And then compress this encode it and send it out as, as, for example, H.264 and some audio codecs onto some internet, over the internet to somewhere else where they pick up this and decode it. Have you ever tried to rip a DVD or a Blu-ray? It takes, oh no, of course you haven't. <laughs> it takes a while. Uh, this one, could take four 1080p uh, HD media streams and rip it on the fly without delay and send it out. We are talking about a few milliseconds delay. Uh, so it's a powerful machine. And while doing that, it could also receive four HD um, streams and present it locally to displays and, and speakers. It was a really, and is, a really powerful machine. If you were going, it's very common to hear, oh, no, 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 but you can just buy stuff coming off the shelf equipment, um, Intel PC, and then you're off you go. No, that's not true. If you were going to do something similar at the time, you would need several racks of equipment to get the same type of performance. So, <coughs> That was the challenge, uh, to put all this electronic in and program it. And, and just looking at the specs, what's inside, in the audio board here, we had one big FPGA, nine uh, audio DSPs. Uh, we had the power PC to orchestrate it all. It was 16 layers of electronics. 
Uh, next to it, just above it, it was a video board, uh, even stronger. There were 10 Da Vinci chips, which each have four cores, so that's 40 cores. Uh, five FPGAs, um, and, and this board was, had 22 layers of electronics. Apparently at the time it was the most advanced PCB ever constructed here in Norway. Um, you don't typically create electronics with 22 layers of, of uh, copper, but we did. And in addition there was this traditional audio board. So from a geek point of view, uh, what we're talking about here is a piece of electronic that we des designed ourselves. 10,000 components, 44 layers of, uh, uh, on the PCBs. 56 processes uh, cores of different types. We even have different endianness on some of them. Communicating fast with each other and it was all run by several million lines of code written in C and C++. We, from we came up with this idea, we are going to make this one. Uh, it took 20 months to complete this codec and ship it out into the market. And I remember 20 months at the time, it was really long time because we were used to cycle times like 12, 14, 15 months and somebody thought, oh, we will never be finished. 20 months, that's a disaster. But once we were out there and started making money on this one, it was like, all right, okay, we, it's working. But the very interesting thing to note here is how many software engineers that are involved in a project like this. 40, 50 software engineers compared to four or five people working on electronics, two, three on the mechanics and design, and, and so on. Some organizations creating boxes like this they optimize the development process around hardware engineers, the electronic engineers. But Tanberg really deeply, deeply understood that we are a software company and we, our development process is focused around software development. And the other disciplines, they have to kind of follow that pace instead. So looking at kind of development pr practices that we were used in the Saturn project. We used continuous planning, always attack high risk first, very heavy focus on feedback mechanisms, continued integration, and this was in 2007 and 2008. Um, and um, we used the dashboards for visualizing the status throughout the project. We divided the teams in the way you see here, and for everyone educated in modern ways of doing stuff, you will realize that that's the wrong way to do it. But it worked for us. Um, we, everything was developed in parallel, hardware, software, everything was happening at the same time when we started. There was no handovers between the electronics to the software and so on. We used iterations and time boxing. We had a daily 15 minutes morning assembly of the elders, that's what I call it. Uh, who is the elders in this organization? Well, you decide. Do you want to be on the meeting or not? It's an open meeting. Uh, and those el meeting of the elders are still running at Lysak today, I know. So it's, it's a successful way of meeting and synchronizing effort. Um, and we had early and many prototypes uh, during those 20 years. So when we had this product, we had a very powerful codec that we could now reuse the same IDs and make simpler versions of it not so powerful, um, but cheaper. But we could also make specialized versions. So desktop version, and we also had a room just like this one, released in March 2010, the DX, no, the EX90. Uh, and this is a nice comment to get back uh, from the analysts that this is what I wanted. And the EX90 was a really beautiful piece of video conferencing equipment. Um, but the same technology also went into this system that we also sold. Um, typically for big, there were, there were some corporations that came in and said, we want 12 of these uh, and have them installed around all our offices uh, in, in the world. 
And together with things we already had, like PC-based solutions, fantastic networking products. Uh, this is the secret, by the way, in video conferencing. If you want to compete in video conferencing, forget about the endpoints. Focus on the networking side. That's where the difficult stuff is, not the endpoints. Fantastic stuff. And a lot of other things we had already. And in 2010, 2009, well, to also 2008, we were winning so hard uh, that I think the competitors basically gave up. Uh, and maybe that was the reason why Cisco gave up and just acquired us instead of competing with us. So, some observations from Tamburg. The development process. Oh, that must have been rigid. Must, must, the only way to do things like this is to have a rigid process, isn't it? Well, we had none. As an engineer joining Tanberg back in the days, for many, this was the first impression, impression. No documentation, no routines. People were just fooling around, not following plans. Decisions postponed, nobody decided. Little respect for management, little modularization, lack of precision, sloppiness, and people were not really working hard. But then after a while, you started to notice that, hmm, people communicate. It's a very high focus on important stuff. There's an embedded slack in the organization. People have time to do the right things. They can relax, they can think, they can collaborate, and, and so on, um, and innovate. Continuous planning, effective decisions, autonomous organization, very high respect for the doers, no integration period, spectacular products, deliver early, the products just came up very early, and we were running at a sustainable pace, yes? It's, uh, I will come back to that one, actually. Uh, and if not, um, I have something about it. Remind me if I don't sp spend time on that. So while you still saw the negative stuff, you started to appreciate the positive side even more. And you forgot about the negatives. And if you just look at the positive components, the, the observations from Tanberg, if you just look at this list, you, you might not and say, oh, that doesn't sound too bad. Is it agile? Is it scrum, lean, damning? It's none of these. Uh, it's very, it was very compatible with agile, scrum, lean, damming. When I came in, uh, I, I already knew and had studied very well uh, Agile, Scrum, Lean, Deming, I knew it. Uh, and I was looking at what we did at Tarnberg, and it's like, it's similar, but it's different. And once you know the founders and those who were involved in Tarnberg in the beginning, they didn't read books like that. They used common sense and their gut feeling fast iterations, and they continuously improved. And this is something that Tarnberg basically invented. It was invented in-house. Um, but it's certainly a good thing. And the nice thing is that everything you see here, you can find kind of the reasons, the academic background for it, if you like, uh, in books like this. I recommend all of these books, and that's why they are here. If you want to understand, if you want to understand a Norwegian industrial success, then you will find it in those books together with the slides that I just presented, I think. And here are some thoughts about negative and positive components, because everything has a negative component as well as a positive component. So if you want to improve something, it's so easy to focus on the negative side and try to fix that without necessarily realizing that you are reducing the positive side by even more. And a typical signature for a mediocre organization, 
and then I'm talking about anything that doesn't look like Tanberg. Um, <laughs> they are often like this. Boring, boring, boring. There isn't much negative here, and, but there isn't much positive either. They, are just, they just exist. But if you look at great organizations, often you find profiles and signatures like this. Uh, Collins says it like uh, this in Good to Great. Managing your problems can only make you good. Actually, he used good instead of mediocre. Um, whereas building your opportunities is the only way to become great. Knut Arne Eggen says the same thing in Gofoten. Uh, and that you should continue working on things you are already good at. And then you should rely on complementære ferdigheter <laughs> to uh, create a team out of this. All right. So, instead of following procedures and, and rules and regulations and so on, we did have some very strong principles of effective product development. I'm going to move the receiver on this one on the other side because the clicker is not properly working. So we'll see how this goes. Maybe. Anyway, principles for effective product development. We all know that few high-tech projects are like running down a paved road where you can see the goal in the end of the road. Typical projects are more like extreme orienteering in difficult terrain with a group of people. It's dark. And at best, we have a sketchy map as guidance. And the key thing is also, for a lot of well-run projects, is that it doesn't matter if not everyone reached the cabin in the end of the day. I mean, there is absolutely no success unless all of them reach the cabin. So thinking about projects like this might make you reconsider a few things that are traditionally, but the way we thought about it was that we need to embrace the chaos. We need to embrace the uncertainty. We don't know what is going to happen. And for this bus to pass through uh, this crossing, and for everyone else to survive, it's about continuously observing, adapting, changing, and then repeat over and over again. You can't plan, you can't plan this ahead. It doesn't work, because the context is changing all the time. There is another way to do it. So embrace chaos, or learn to surf the wave, or, or whatever, but just deal with the complexity. Don't dream about a simple world where everything is calm. Make your plans and then just run the bus as fast as you can through this crossing. You have to celebrate the organization. Don't celebrate the individuals. Don't celebrate the teams or the projects or whatever. It's the whole organization that should celebrate their existence, the success. So, uh, and we did that a lot in Danburg. And typically, the parties, they were before we launched products, not after. It, it was actually the intention, no, 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 we don't celebrate after the project. That's not when we need it. We need celebrations when things are tough, when people are tired, then we need a big party. So that was typical Danburg way. Also, admire the doers try to create an autonomous organization. Lift up and praise the people that, engineers that do the soldering, that are writing code, salespeople that go out to customers with products and uh, get money to bring back into the organization. That's what you need to do. And you have to do that systematically all the time and lift them up and, the, and admire them. And in Tanberg, we had this thing called productives and non-productives. And we didn't want to have much more than 10% non-productives. And all the non-productives, they knew that they, they had a very important role to make the day for the 
engineer or the salesperson easier. And it was kind of a bit embarrassing to be a non-productive, but if you did a really good job on supporting these two roles, then you felt good anyway. But uh, that's, we, we didn't call them corporate fat overhead and things like that, but n it was a term, productives and non-productives, and we didn't want that to go beyond 10%. Sometimes it was 11, sometimes it was 12, but we tried to keep it at maximum 10%. Those who, those who are working in a company are receiving salaries, but not really doing real work. We, need, we, we focused on communication, and we realized that documentation is not a really good way of communicating. Um, first of all, it's time consuming, it's boring, and the customer are not paying for it. Usually it's just something that you do because you think you have to do it. And uh, one of the first thing I heard when I joined uh, Tanberg was that, uh, well, documentation only if the customer pays for it. So when we started to deliver stuff to, uh, uh, to defense industry, for example, we also, uh, big customers in defense industry, also, we delivered equipment to oil rigs and uh, oil industry, etc., high and, and medical devices. Um, we could do that, but then they had to pay for us writing the documentation that they needed. Uh, for other customers, they didn't care. They just want the equipment and a simple use manual, and off they go. But also, another thing about lack of documentation is that you probably s know, have seen this in, in some organizations, uh, the senior engineers, they are hiding behind piles of documentations that they have written. It's like a wall. So a junior programming coming, uh, junior engineer coming in is not allowed to communicate over that wall. It's like, oh, you have to read that stuff before you can talk to me. Um, and it's, it's usually just garbage anyway in those documents. Uh, and if you work, walked around in the office, uh, engineering office at least, okay, you wouldn't see ring binders. We never used tools for documenting our uh, design, internal behavior, or something like that. But we did communicate all the time. So the picture on the left there is kind of typical. Introduce Slack. It seems like everyone understands that you can't fill a washing machine completely and then cram in your last sock into it and then slam the door and then put it on. If you do that, you know that you will get crap out. Um, so the concept of Slack is something that most people understand to some extent. And, and we understand that if we have really dirty trousers, for example, uh, maybe we just put that one thing into, into the washing machine. To optimize for effectiveness instead of optimizing for efficiency. We don't have a difference on those two words in Norwegian, but in English it's perfectly clear. Efficiency in this case would be to have as much close as possible into the washing machine to get maximize the throughput but effectiveness would be to have the right amount of clothes into it so that you get good results every time. For an organization doing difficult stuff, it's kind of similar. Look at the one in the middle there. What is it called for? What is this called? The fifth in puzzle? Yeah. It's not a really hard puzzle, but it would be really hard if you didn't have any slack. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and this is... This is an illustration of if you have hard problems, you need a lot of slack into the organization. That's the only way you can solve it. Um, and, and you also need the slack to be able to create the tools you need. You, have to, you need the slack to sharpen your saw, to improve your tools. You need slack to innovate. You need slack to think. You need the, more, the harder the problem is, the more slack you need. And this is something that was very clearly said and communicated in the Tambor culture. And, and Snorri Kjesby was one of them uh, leading in engineering, he was really good at this. If that when we had kind of problems, struggling to get the products out, 
he helped introduce more Slack into the system so that we could solve it and then move on. The typical reaction in most organizations is to do the opposite, and that is to apply pressure and put more stuff into it and drive people harder, and that's like putting in the last piece here. It stops. Um, if you are interested in this, uh, Tom DeMarco has written a book about Slack where he explains very clearly why it doesn't work to add pressure to knowledge work and high tech product development in this case. Beware of the observer effect. Remember that film? Have you seen it? Anyway, they had this idea that it was possible to to observe, to figure out how a kitchen was used, and that the person being observed didn't change the behavior by this one observing. Of course, that didn't happen. Uh, but the observer effect is like, if you, if you take an example, if you, stand, if you put yourself behind someone typing, writing code, it's a fair chance that that person will actually rather write, add codes into the code base rather than deleting code from the code base. Things like that. You are affecting the performance by watching. It's also more, it's less likely that that person will suddenly sit back and think for half an hour. Um, so by, just by observing, you are disturbing knowledge work. You are disturbing knowledge workers. You are disturbing teams and projects that are trying to do something difficult. Now, if the individual, if the team, if the project needs this information to go forward so that they come up with these kind of feedback mechanisms themselves, then it's fine. But if you have some kind of corporate measure, metric kind of system, get rid of it. You don't want it because you're destroying knowledge work. The worst management by objectives is the, is the worst strategy ever, kind of business strategy ever invented. This idea that you could set a target, a goal, and then let a lot of people run towards that goal, um, it's, it doesn't work. Um, they might reach that objective, but then they are so tired that they're not willing to go to the next objective or they quit the company, or they leave you um, for other reasons. But there is another way of doing this, which can have a similar effect. You can point out a direction and say, this is approximately where we're going. And a nice way of pointing out the direction is, instead of pointing, you just put boundaries and say, we are not going to do anything outside of this boundary. But inside this boundary, yeah, that's, and then you get kind of a sector which is somehow pointing out a direction. And as an example of that is that everyone that started in Tamburg, after a couple of weeks, they had this idea that, oh, yeah, if you do this and that, then grandma can talk to her grandchildren before they go to kindergarten and things like that. I mean, it's a nice idea, but it was very, very clearly stated no fucking way. They can do body driti. We were not going to make those kind of systems because we had boundaries that basically said we are only going to make products and sell products to large successful businesses with loads of money that is that are willing to pay us loads of money for our products. So whenever someone came up with this kind of marginalized idea that, oh, yeah, yeah, and then people can sit and watch football matches together and so on, <laughs> no fucking way. And that's one, that's, that's a way to point out the direction for a group of uh, people trying to develop uh, high-tech products. But at the same time, you should break the rules. Um, and... And it was even part of the initial training for our, um, all employees was that, no, no, we don't accept that you just follow rules because you want to follow rules. That's no excuse for doing stupid stuff. If you think it is a bad idea, break the rule and do your thing instead. 
And an example of that could be, well, we had people that helped out buying disks and RAM and computer equipment, for example. Um, and, and that's typically a place you should go to get stuff sourced. sourced. If you needed a new disk, that's where you might go. But we were also told in kind of the initial training that but you are not allowed to move your problem onto someone else and then sit back and wait for it to be solved within a couple of days. Because you know, you can go to, an, to a, any store and buy this stuff, put it into your computer, and you can continue working. So there was no excuse. You couldn't kind of blame your problems on some kind of IT department or a support organization that was supposed to do it. So break the rules was built into how we were working. And it was also encouraged by management. You should reward courage and failures. And the worst thing I hear is this, ah, oh, do it right the first time. It's, it's nice in some contexts, but when it comes to hard problems that you're trying to solve, you can't do it right the first time. You have to iterate, you have to learn, you have to do it over and over again until you succeed. So you should celebrate and reward courage, and you should also celebrate failures and think about them as learning. This boy would never be able to become a rocket scientist if he was supposed to do it right the first time. I mean, that's, that would stop the, the progress of this thing. Focus on the whole product. If you look at the monster truck on the right-hand side, and you consider each component, everything is better on the thing on the right-hand side compared to the left. The wheels are larger, the engine is stronger, the lights are probably better, the, the chair is fabulous, and uh, everything is better on the right-hand side, but it's not the balanced solution. What you see on the left-hand side is balanced solution. It's a result of systems thinking. The thing on the uh, right-hand side is a result of Taylorism and reductionism, where the idea is, oh, let's take this problem, divide it into small pieces, have different teams that work on these components, and then we assemble the, it together in the end. It's kind of obvious when you look at the car, but for all of us that have been involved in software, we recognize software solutions that look a lot like on the right-hand side. And uh, you can, you can Get balanced solutions if you force everyone to think about the whole product all the time and if you avoid component teams and uh, focus on components inside the product. Do continuous planning. Um, what I didn't mention when I talked about um, the Saturn project was that we also had this room with lots of uh, glass on the walls. And there were post-it notes all over the room. It was in the space area, for those who remember. Um, and it was um, yeah, January, February, March, the months on this, these windows. On the post-it notes, it was things that we thought would be finished. Everyone involved in the project can walk over to that wall and move those post-it notes to where they thought it should have been. So we didn't have this kind of Gantt diagrams, with, and actually Gantt diagrams was forbidden in the organization. Um, it's like cancer in any organization, it's incredibly painful and probably impossible to get rid of once you're infected. Um, but So we didn't have these kind of plans that people were supposed to follow and so on. We were doing continuous planning by moving those post-it notes and everyone could do so, not just the project manager or something like that. This is this is an idea that we tend to appreciate when we hear it from kind of big names like Winston Churchill and Eisenhower. And plans are nothing, planning is everything. We, we kind of, yeah, that sounds cool. And then we go back and we make our silly plan, static plan. But nobody says it better than Mike Tyson himself. And, and so. There are a few plans that actually survive the reality. Uh, so instead, focus on continuous planning. That's what you want to do. Aim for approximately right rather than accurately wrong. That could be used in many contexts. 
but also in this context, when we made new products, and we did a few every year, which big products, like the C90 was a typical really big project, but we had similar size projects running continuously, churning out of the organization. Um, the typical approach was like, hmm, yeah, we need a product approximately around here. Yeah. Oh, let's, let's run. And then we started developing the product. Uh, and we were learning while we were doing it, but also, but sometimes we just went off in some direction and we had to kind of work with the sales force, work with the market so that they moved the target and, and we could hit it. Not necessarily in the bullseye, but somewhere close. And for a, for a video conferencing market at the time, it might be still the case, but probably not, that wasn't really a problem because anything was good enough. Uh, and uh, it was an unmature market. We were growing it very fast. So a nice product approximately around here would be a winner. Um, instead of thinking, 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 oh, no, aim, 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 calculate, calculate, wait for 12 months, and then, yeah, maybe, and then you shoot. So, uh, so this was a much better approach, to aim for approximately right than an accurately wrong. Um, <coughs> Just let this video run for a few seconds. This idea about sometimes when you work with software releases, we are also talking about release trains. If those release trains are running very seldom, then <laughs> everyone wants their feature onto that release train. Oh, it's so important. Everything becomes equally important. Everything needs to go on that train because it doesn't go very often. And, and a lot of the features and things that you want on this release train <laughs> doesn't really need to be there. But it's there just in case. Um, so if you start running these release trains much, much more frequent, then only the high priority features and change requests will need to go onto that train and maybe if you wait a couple of um, rides into town, then this feature might not, oh, it wasn't that important anyway, we choose another one. So the key thing is that if you release seldom, then everything becomes equally important, and it's too much. If you release very often, you got not only get the linear growth, now improvement, you get an exponential improvement, because there is a lot of things that is suddenly, ah, oh, it doesn't need to go into town anyway. Seek early feedback. Pixar says that our films are never finished, they are just released. So that's part of the time boxing. But also I used the green bananas to illustrate that we shipped products out to the market that was not finished yet. And we did it deliberately. It was on purpose. Because we needed the feedback. And we couldn't wait. Because timing is everything. There is another company that do this. And it did it while we were working as well. Uh, I think they were called Apple or something like that. They made the phone that couldn't even do MMS when it was uh, launched into the market. I mean, that was completely common among all telephones at the time, but the iPhone didn't have support for MMS, plus a, a lot of other things that you would expect on a phone. But they had some success with it. Um, <laughs> and, and so did we. So th it's about kind of making the customers understand that, well, it's, it will be better, but this is what we have now. And then if they are interested, then you can continue investing in that. If they are not interested, then you have saved yourself a lot of time um, by not completing the product comp um, in the direction you initially thought. And this is kind of similar idea, but never reveal your next products. Don't have roadmaps, um, and we we named it. We, we called it the Sinclair effect. I don't know if that is the correct thing, but that was referring to Alistair Sinclair, uh, you know, Spectrum and Hamstrad and so on. Um, the problem he was the kind of the British genius comparable to Bill Gates, uh, but he had a problem that every time he presented the product, 
he, he, he just had to talk about the things he had in the lab. That was coming out a few months later. The result being that people didn't buy this. They were waiting for the next thing, always. And then he went bankrupt. Um, so, and we, we didn't want that to happen. So when we launched our products, we told the market and we told the salespeople, our own salespeople, they got to know this at the same day as the markets. So our salespeople didn't know what we were working on. Nobody knew what we were working on until it was released. Once again, there is another company, I think it's called Apple or something like that. They have the same strategy. They don't tell about what the next product is about, the next iPhone, the next Mac Pro. It, it happened, it's launched, and then the sales force knows about it, and the customers knows about it, and then the product is out. It also meant we were never late, because nobody knew. So if we had a product we hoped to kind of ship in February or in January, we could always say, no, no let's ship it in April instead. Um, so that's no, no roadmaps. That was the Tamburg way. Avoid corporate standards and procedures. And this is an illustration. We all know that waterfall is bad, but it's every, time of, every type of canned procedures, this is the way to do it, routines that you should follow or whatever, has this similar effect that it works as long as you, the throughput is low, maybe. But as soon as you increase the throughput, you put under pressure, the end result is random. So this is an attempt to illustrate upper management trying to figure out what engineering is doing. <laughs> I've seen this over and over again um, in other places, not in Hamburg. And forget about innovation workshops. It was actually forbidden to have these spaghetti post-it notes, innovation workshops uh, in, in Tamburg. Because our problem wasn't innovation. Our in capacity to innovate was much higher than our capacity to execute and deliver stuff. So we rather focused on executing and deliver stuff. But we also knew that if there was enough slack in the organization, we would get innovations, micro-innovations on the products that we had. And if we were at times where we needed lots of information, we c uh, innovations, we could just reduce the pressure on the organization, introduce more slack into the system, and we would become innovative. And we had, while we didn't have these kind of workshops, we did have kind of play times. We encouraged skunk works, collaborations between people, um, in between projects and what they were supposed to do and so on. Collective ownership, I think it's a very important idea. I'm not going to elaborate on that one. But also in code, that means you should never have code snippets that is owned by some individuals or a team or whatever. Everyone should be able to change every piece of code in your code base. As long as they work for you, of course, in your organization. No time writing or detailed cost control. We didn't have that. We didn't have any system even for recording holidays. It said in the contract, 37 and a half hours per week, five or maybe it was six weeks of holiday. You deal with it. Uh, we didn't have a system for recording that at all. Um, there is a company called SAS Institute that always come up uh, high on the great place to work. And Jan Man said something <laughs> very descriptive there. It's, you know, it's not that difficult to get a great company. It's, it's about, you know, treating your employees like they are, you know, not criminals. Um, and if you look at the mechanisms that organizations put to place, a lot of these mechanisms are there because the organization doesn't trust you, uh, the employees. And it's a, it's, it's a terrible and slow way of doing it. I used to say you should, and, and we used to say, you should always optimize for your 98% trustworthy employees. That's, and if you have a few non-trustworthy, forget about them. Don't let the others suffer, because there might be a chance that someone is misusing the system. Build the company on trust. That's, that's the recommendation there. And last, but not least, is that working in an environment like this, it's very exhausting if you're the wrong type. Um, there were actually some companies that we couldn't hire from because we knew we would never be able to reprogram them. Um, 
And, uh, but what we were looking for, passion, attitude, and skills. Um, and, and that is, you, you couldn't get into the engineering organization if you didn't have the passion and attitude and the skills. Uh, and we did that in a hiring process where uh, typical candidates met usually 10 different people inside of Tanberg. And we didn't have an agenda on what we were asking about, but we were looking for passion and attitudes, and often sometimes skills. Uh, and in the end of the interview rounds, we just met, and if everyone was like, yeah, we want that person, then we hired. If someone was like, hmm, I don't know, there's something, then we didn't hire. We didn't need to hire if there was someone that we weren't sure about. So that summarizes it. Um, I know it should be 14 principles, because Toyota Way has 14 principles, Deming Way has 14 principles. So I have to rely on this break the rules, because I do actually have 21. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to read them out loud again. And this is what I call the Tanberg Way of engineering. Thank you. That's it. I'm open for questions. Oh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I wasn't really uh, prepared for that uh, question. Um, <laughs> so I don't really know what to say. But um, now, the, the fact is that the Lusaker team, uh, Tanberg was very heavily based on Lusaker. So we, we've when I gave this talk for nine years, similar kind of talks for nine years, I called it the Lee Sucker way and not the Tanberg way. The Lee Sucker team is stronger than ever, uh, and the current uh, product portfolio is beyond spectacular. So this is examples. Actually, the C90 is down there. Um, and Cisco contributed a lot. Uh, we grew up, we became more mature. Uh, but when I talk about more mature, we didn't change much of the Tanberg way. But more mature in the way that we understood that our products were used in some kind of context. So this was very much improved uh, to, um, to see the bigger picture. We also learned a lot about un kind of logistics, shipping, unboxing, money making, production, and so on. So we even designed started to design the frames. And, and look at this, there are even wheels here. So that you can take this one and you can tilt it up, put it into the elevator, go up and tilt it down and then bring it into the office. Things like that, we, we didn't knew that while we were at Thunberg. Uh, maybe we would have got there, but uh, that process was accelerated very much uh, as we joined uh, Cisco. Uh, and a lot of machine learning, artificial intelligence stuff. And I have to mention Snyder, because while I say Pedro Coxta was the arguably the most important for the Tanberg success, uh, Snyder should be mentioned as the most important for making sure that Cisco got value out of this acquisition. Because he was leading Tanberg into Cisco, not only making room for Tanberg inside of Cisco, but also making sure that we changed Tanberg in such a way that it c was compatible with the Cisco way of doing things. So <coughs> when you say, what, what happened? Uh, did we have to change much? And I would say, yes, we did have to change much. Some of it was good, some of it was bad. Uh, the reason why I call it the Tanberg way here is that maybe one third of the principles that I listed was not, is not really true anymore inside of Cisco. Uh, but they, were repla they are replaced with other things that are not better, but different. Um, so, um, and another thing that happened was that since uh, Cisco paid 19 billion Norwegian kroners for Tanberg, a lot of money came into Norway, into Oslo, into actually around Lysaker area. So, all of these companies have something to do with Tanberg. Um, 
most people stayed, most people in the engineering, in the Tanberg engineering, stayed after the acquisition because Cisco is a really nice company to work for. If you ever get a chance, go for it. Uh, it's of the big companies, it's one of the coolest companies to work for. But also there were some people that said, well, oh, I'm not doing this. So they maybe they went out and started some of these companies uh, that are listed here. So a lot of positive things happened. Um, not for Tanberg, Tanberg died. Um, but a lot of things happened for the video conferencing industry and for the business in the, especially around the Lusaka area in, in Oslo. Yes, that was one question. Um, Another one, yes. Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is actually something that I'm, I'm uh, asked over and over again uh, when I do presentations like this. Usually in when, when I was working for Cisco, I'm not working for Cisco, by the way. I left one month ago, so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> That's useful to clarify. I'm working for Equinor now, completely different industry. Um, but uh, when I did uh, these kind of presentations also inside of Cisco, I got this uh, question about, oh, yeah, we want to do that. Uh, give us a recipe. Oh, no, <laughs> you missed my talk. You can't have a recipe for doing things. You can't have procedures, routines. This is something you have to grow. And what I usually say is that a team, an organization that is willing to do continuous improvement every day will always outperform someone that has kind of given up to improve. Uh, one day it will, they will pass. And I'm not 100% sure if this is correct, but there is this saying from Toyota, saying that we don't try to make the perfect car. We just try to suck less every day. So that's why we have the Toyota way of doing things. And I would say that it's, this is also a result of the Tanberg way, is trying to suck less every day. And you can, I think you can take a lot of organizations and grow them in some kind of sensible direction, but then you have to get rid of a few mechanisms that are there, which are impossible <laughs> to pass. For example, if you have a, if you believe in, in measuring your employees, if you believe in detailed project cost control, things like that, you have to get rid of a lot of things in order to grow in a sensible direction. Yes, another? Yep. Uh, gut feeling <laughs> to some extent. No, but, uh, but it was also, while there was a, a complete disconnect between engineering and sales, there were a few overrunners. Uh, and also, uh, the engineers were supposed to go out and visit customers uh, and spend time with customers. So we basically knew, we had a sh common shared understanding of where the market is going. Um, the, so the decision process is difficult to kind of pinpoint, but it was there and it was very, very precise and correct. Yes? And that is a very important point. We used what we made. Now, if you are building nuclear power stations or missiles, you might not be an expert <laughs> user on your own equipment. <laughs> but we were in the lucky position where everyone working with this could actually use our own products. So we were expert users and engineers at the same time. And if that is the case, you might need to organize your engineering differently than if you were doing power stations or nuclear missiles. Yes. Yeah. We, it, it depends on what you mean with fair competition. We had competitors, really nice, cool com competitors. Uh, Polycom was one of them. From an engineering point of view, we really enjoyed competing with them. They came up with great stuff. We tried to copy some of their stuff. We tried to come up with great stuff and so on. We, it was a relay. 
Um, but after a while, we were winning too hard. Uh, so we didn't have much competition. We were driving the market, basically. We had 50% market share. Um, if, uh, I think if we, were, uh, if we were competing in a very mature market, with a uh, lot of good players, and it was difficult to find a new product that were appreciated and successful. I think we would have needed to change something, but we wouldn't need to change much of the principles. And, and that's, the, that's the beauty of principles. Procedures, they break down immediately when context is changing. Principles, they have a tendency to kind of survive change for a while. I think you could have used nearly all of this, uh, also in, uh, in a competing, highly competitive market. Yes? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. No, it's, it's a very valid observation, and uh, we have actually been studied many times by also uh, MITs and Sloan and, and MBAs and, and so on. And uh, yes, there is fascination <laughs> when they are studying us, and uh, we really un we did understand that they come from another point of view. Um, but yes, we had discussions, and this is kind of different from a typical MBA study, yes. Yep. But we made 19 billion Norwegian kroners on this, so. Yes? It's like an observation that your list of principles there are very similar to the principles underlying development of open source software. Yeah. Open source software follows pretty much the same model. Yeah. And that's why it's successful. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's nice. And uh, it's... Oh, I'm not going to bring that into, but you know, the difference between science, um, um, but I'm doing it anyway, science and religion, <laughs> is that religion is invented, uh, while science is something that, given enough time, someone that doesn't know anything about this will discover the same type of principles, like gravity, for example. Any group of people would... Civilization eventually will dis discover gravity and, uh, and the physical principles. I think something like this runs here as well. It's common sense in the bottom that uh, and, and fast repeating and continuous improvement, etc., that ends up with something like this. And nonsense wouldn't work in an open source environment because we would never hear about them. They would kind of <laughs> disappear. So by the nature of open source, I, would, uh, yeah, I agree. It looks like kind of compa uh, compatible with this, yes. Yep. That was from the very, very, very beginning. And uh, I, should, uh, I should actually show, if I understood your question correctly, but the thing is that this guy, Jan Christian Uppsal, I found... Um, when I did a talk about this 10 years ago, I found an interview that he did in 2002. Um, and he said that I didn't, I didn't work in a regular corporate environment. I, I had to kind of get out of this and create something new, basically. Um, and the other thing was that momentum is the most important thing. We just, you just have to find, you just have to rev up your engine and start driving very, very fast in some direction. It will outperform those who are trying to steer the car nicely into a goal. And uh, the last thing, which even have a really nice calculation error, is about it's, it's okay to be approximately right. It doesn't have to be perfect in any way. And if you classify these things, I, I think it would I, uh, put it into autonomy, momentum, and approximately right. And this was the starting point for Tanberg in 1990 uh, as well. Um, eventually, he, he said, I don't understand what you're doing in engineering anyway. Uh, you are talking to each other and thinking and discussing instead of doing stuff. So, uh, 
Apparently, he, he asked um, to have his axis removed from engineering. <laughs> <laughs> but then Peter Kokstad ran the engineering instead. Yeah. But uh, yeah, a business genius, but also how to create an organization from the very beginning. So we never had to change much. We could just build on top of these principles uh, for two decades. Uh, it's the last session, so I think it's possible to have one more question or so, but otherwise it's probably a good idea to uh, go and grab a beer. All right, okay, the last question. <laughs> so, um, Apple don't say what they're going to do, but they're in a customer, and uh, they're in a business-to-customer environment, and yeah. uh, customers don't have like, the power to say that we are going to do this at some point. Yeah. How do you manage expectations when you're in a business-to-business -business environment? Actually, I had expected that question as well, but, and it's a really, really, really good question. Um, but I haven't prepared anything. The question is, uh, like, Apple cannot tell their customers because it's a business-to-consumer thing, but we are a business-to-business. -business. And uh, how do we manage expectations? And if there was a question, was there anything negative about Tanberg? I would also have to mention that some customers, some um, big players in the market, they called us the Tanberg. They said, you are technology geniuses, but marketing morons. Uh, and one of the reasons was that we didn't have any roadmaps. We, didn't, we were not able to give expectations for how they are going to evolve their technology internally, even though they were reliant on our technology. So... We tried to say, oh, no, but we promised that it will be good, <laughs> but it wasn't <laughs> good enough for them. So the lack of roadmap was a good point, but it was also a weak point. Uh, so you're perfectly right in asking that one. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>